This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Hey, this is Brian Peña. I always join the Vito Vodcast, the best vodcast in the United States. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the latest, the freshest edition of Tiger Stock with Chirko and Company. I am your host, Vito Geranimo Chirko, along to my usual psychic and broadcast partner and fun. That is at Akram Doc and Jack, John Charles Macaroon. John, how are you doing? Vito, lots to get into. Want to thank the sponsors of this fine broadcast, the Detroit Sports Commission and the Legacy Football Organization. Some news was made. Uh, it was really interesting, too, because Monday I was kind of thinking, what do I want to talk about in the Detroit Sports Podcast Address? You know, the two-minute podcast where I just kind of give a simple take on something. And I was just kind of sitting here in the office, and I was thinking, you know what? I know that uh, people are kind of wondering who's going to take over the broadcast spot, who's going to be the new play-by-play person, because the Detroit Tigers obviously had to let go of Rod and Mario. And uh, Rod Allen did break his silence on a television show in Detroit, and it aired over the weekend. And so I thought about it. I sat back and I said, okay, let me just talk about it real fast. And literally... An hour and a half later, it was announced Matt Shepard is going to be the guy. Uh, A lifelong Detroit Tigers fan, a professional broadcaster. He did a lot of the fill-in work when Rod and Mario had their dust-up there in the last month of the 2018 season. He's the guy that's been chosen. Fox Sports Detroit said they interviewed about 100 people. And uh, he was the guy that eventually got the job. And so I'm very curious. You know, the reaction on our Twitter page, at Detroit Podcast, kind of in a mixed bag. Kind of, you know, half and half. Most people are like, okay, it's a professional broadcaster. He'll add to the broadcast. We know him. It's a familiar voice, obviously, having hosted a radio show, having been the voice of Michigan basketball, Eastern Michigan football. He's been around, and he's a professional broadcaster that's been around Fox Sports Detroit for almost two decades. So those fans of him are going to continue to support him, but some people also have reservations saying, you know what, he's just not that natural at baseball and sometimes they just kind of maybe would have wanted somebody new. So I'm curious, what did you think about the news, and what was your take on Matt Shepard being named the play-by-play voice of the Detroit Tigers? Well, thanks for letting me talk now, by the way. He's been a baseball fan all his life. So he's a baseball lifer, tons of baseball knowledge, and from Michigan. So he has affection and fandom for the Tigers as well. And well-versed, multidimensional, with, as you said, calling Michigan hoops, on the radio, covering Eastern Michigan football, being a fill-in play-by-play man for so long in his, almost, you could say, illustrious career, covering sports locally, hosting a local radio show, sports talk show, in the morning. Uh, Shep Shower and Shave, I love the name, by the way, of that radio show that he does host. Now, what happens with these other gigs? Does he have to give up one or two of them? And we'll, we'll see. What happens with that? But I would have to believe that he's not going to be able to continue hosting his radio show on a daily basis. And that radio show must be going by the wayside, right? Because baseball is such a long season. 162 games, six months out of the year. He has to travel for all those road games. He can't be there to host his radio show. So you would have to believe, John, that he ends up giving up that gig as the host of Shep Shower and Shave, his own uh, daily sports talk radio show. When I say daily, too, Monday through Friday morning sports talk radio show. Now, a lot of the younger fans kind of said the same thing. They're like, well, they kind of want a little bit more spice. And did you see, um, I don't know if you got a chance to see on social media, it blew up. Snoop Dogg did some play-by-play for hockey, and it was just so different because it was like a fan sitting there talking. I, I know Shep is really professional, um, definitely a guy that you can respect because of his work ethic. People will definitely speak highly of him. And I don't have nothing bad to say about him. I just think that with the Tigers, because they're going to lose so many games, you kind of need somebody that's going to move the needle. And a guy like Shep is professional. When I say wait, that, wait. Yeah, I was going to say, professional. You want professional. Yeah. You always want professional, but you also want somebody to move the needle. 
And what that means is I don't think he's going to bring in additional viewers. I think he's going to have his fans. He'll have those that are hardcore fans that are going to watch on television. But I don't think what he's going to add will bring in a new uh, audience. Because, Vito, they're going to lose well over maybe 100 games this year. And it's going to be tough. And so you're going to also have to talk about other things like, you know, maybe some things in social media. Maybe bring up Snoop Dogg and talk about stuff like that. So I don't know if he's going to be able to be all that interesting outside of sports. Because if you listen to his radio show, straight sports. Not a lot of social topics, not a lot of things that you would say outside of sports are that interesting. And so I'm not calling it boring. What I'm saying is I just don't think that for us younger people, you know, in the age group. You're of like, younger people? In You're the part age of group the younger people? Really? Of 18 to 42, I think that the, the demographic that will really support them will be the people 40 and up. So for a guy like you, do you think that uh, Shep's going to bring the analytics and bring the entertainment and keep you drawn, drawn in? Well, I'm going to watch anyways. But... Amongst the rest of the millennials, millennial generation out there, uh, yeah, Matt Shepard probably isn't going to move the needle for those guys. And does he really excite me? Is he going to excite me on a game-to-game basis? Probably not. Is he going to get my rocks off and get me going on a Monday morning? Probably not. But Matt Shepard is a definition of a professional, a consummate pro with the play-by-play mic. Uh, a great voice, a great knowledge of so many different sports, and of baseball especially, once again, being from the area, from the Metro Detroit area, growing up a Detroit Tigers fan, his fandom and his knowledge of the game and of the Tigers from years past as well is extraordinary. So he was terrifically deserving of the position. Now, is he going to be able to relate to all the youth out there and the younger generation that maybe needs some more excitement out of the play-by-play voice, out of the broadcast booth in its entirety? Well, he might not be that guy, that answer. But guess what? Who are you going to hire then? And then FSD really has to open up the pocketbook. We got to believe too, John. By the way, that Fox Sports Detroit, as an entity, was not willing to spend a lot of money on this gig, and that's why I wouldn't say they settled, but they went with the guy internally who had the experience and who they probably didn't have to pay a lot more money to become the play-by-play man. Here are a couple of the responses that we got. Billy writes in on Twitter at Detroit Podcast. Shep's great. Been calling for him to replace the mumbling bomb Gibson for a while. Shep's personable, knowledgeable, and charismatic. Gino gets in. It's a safe hire. Like Shep, but would have preferred a young broadcast team that would grow with the team as it gets better. And so that's kind of the mixed bag reaction that we got is that most people think he's safe, he's conservative, he's pro team. Now, he does criticize the team. If you watch a lot of television and you watch the Tigers, he will put it in a way that is constructively criticizing. Now, does he slant toward the positive and highlight some things that obviously are told to him, talking points? Yes. And that's what Fox Sports Detroit does. You have to be aware that they're a partner with the team. They're not going to be out there slamming the Tigers too much, but they will constructively criticize the organization. It's just, for me, I would have went the younger route. I would have went maybe a guy like Dan Hasty, maybe somebody outside the organization. Some people uh, wrote to us and said, you know what? You should have maybe made overtures to Josh Lewin. He was a guy that became a fan favorite in his time here. So it's not universally loved, not universally hated. I think it's a safe hire, probably the best hire for the Tigers at this point in time. So obviously I give it a B plus. I think he'll do a good job. He'll be professional, but holy cow, man, that guy works. He has a lot of jobs and he does a lot of broadcasting in the state of Michigan. Well, Johnny must be making that moolah. A lot of it, a lot more than me. And you maybe combined. He's making some big bucks. But because he's good at what he does, once again, a consummate pro, a guy deserving of this position. And then how about the rest of the broadcast booth? Have to look into it a little bit more, and that's not too exciting. I would say I'm totally fine with hiring Matt Shepard to be the full-time play-by-play guy for Fox Sports Detroit's presentation of the Tigers games throughout the 2019 campaign and beyond. I would say the color commentators, I'm a little less satisfied. Yeah. Yeah, and a lot of people reacted in that manner on Twitter, too. On my address, I said that the rumors were it was going to be a team of Jack Morris and Kirk Gibson on the TV side. And I was like, oh, really? And yeah, exactly. The combination of Morris and Gibson is more of a tie to the past. Uh, People are definitely going to identify with those guys, but it's just their delivery sometimes a little bit bland. Sometimes, you know, those 1030 California games, I need a little bit more oomph out of the analyst. And uh, many people love Dan Petrie, and they love the fact that he's going to be added as an analyst in the studio and sometimes in the games. So I do think that's a good hire, somebody that uh, obviously well-deserved. His analysis has always been spot on, and people do like it. But yeah, Jack and Gibby, I just think that 
those guys appeal to a demographic that's not me. I, I'm more of a guy that needs a little bit more spunk, a little more energy, a little bit more, not in terms of like a, a guy like Pat McAfee who's trying to do an act in the booth, but somebody in that vein of has the knowledge, can be entertaining, and also kind of move the needle a little bit, say something a little bit edgy, a little bit controversial, kind of like on the verge of maybe saying something inside that you know about that maybe uh, you're not supposed to talk about, but maybe kind of lead people on and be entertaining and kind of reveal a little bit of what people want to know. Because Vito, the team is just going to be really up and down uh, in 2019, a lot of young talent. So I just, I'm just not thrilled with the hire, but uh, for me, I'm probably not going to sit through a whole lot of nine inning games. Hopefully in 2019, we'll be covering it. So uh, we'll be there for the majority of it, maybe we'll bump into Shep and be like, yo, spice it up a little bit. And, uh, you know, listen to Vito. Slip him a tape a little bit and things yeah. like that. Steve definitely was disappointed that you didn't get the job. Steve, the only guy on Twitter in this world that was disappointed that I did not receive the Tigers play-by-play job. Did you get the call? Never got a call. Never applied. <laughs> there were over 100 applicants. So I don't know if really 100 people interviewed, but applicants, that's a lot of applicants yeah. for that Tigers play-by-play job that I did not receive, that I did not apply for, though, either, and did not deserve. Once again, much praise to Matt Shepard. Very deserving. But the color commentators, they're dull. They're mundane. They don't bring a lot of energy. And they appeal to a fan base from the 1980s to the millennial generation, even to you as an oldie but goodie at almost 40 years old, as I like to say for you, Doc. It's not appealing to you. That was a generation before you as well. It's not appealing to you. It's not going to move the needle for you, for me, for any of the millennials out there. And it's hard enough to get people to watch baseball games. Then you have these oldies, oldies but goodies, and they're not going to bring the energy. And the younger generation, the millennials, can't relate to those guys and barely even know who they are. Sad but true, and they, they should. Those guys deserve a lot of respect. Gibby for what he did with the Tigers. Morris, what he did with the Tigers. Morris, the winningest pitcher in the 1980s, a Hall of Fame pitcher at this point. But people don't know who those two individuals are at this point among the younger fan base. And that's sad but true about the current state of Tigers fans and Major League Baseball fans out there. Okay, so did you get a chance to see Rod Allen and some of the comments that he made? He kind of downplayed the situation, and uh, he spoke to Michigan Matters, and that show aired on CBS 62 on Sunday. And what he essentially said was, we had a bad day. We had essentially what was a verbal scuffle. It did not get to the point of choking and things like that. It probably, from Rod's perspective, got into a little bit of maybe a push and a shove or maybe kind of going chest to chest uh, in anger. But in the end, he denies categorically that he put uh, Mario and Pemba in a chokehold. And you look at it from the other side, Mario has been kind of silent. He put out a statement and things like that. Mario potentially was going to go and file a police report after the incident. And he thought, you know what, this will probably be a black mark against the Tigers and Fox Sports Detroit. So he decided against it. Now, whether there's going to be pending litigation regarding his termination, that's yet to be determined. Like I said earlier, he's gone radio silent and things like that. We've made overtures to try and get him to talk, and we'll continue. But I just think that Rod is trying to definitely do some damage control, trying to spin this in a way because of the fact that probably this year he won't get a job. But in the future, I think he's going to try to go out there and earn a living being an analyst. And with, with the vast experience that he has, he probably could go to Arizona, teams like Milwaukee, if they're in need of an analyst and do the job. But a big market team, I just think that when you have a physical altercation with a coworker on that stage, it kind of makes it tough for you to be really highly employable. I think he's done as a broadcaster. Done! Completely done. There is no team that will employ him to be their color commentator moving forward, even as an analyst in the pregame or postgame. I mean, he put his hands on the neck of Mario and Pemba. Now, he exclaimed that it did not happen. But fake news. In this day and age of fake news, I think that screams of fake news right there. Rod Allen denying it. But guess what? What is he going to say? He's going to say, oh, yeah, I put my hands on the neck of Mario and Pemba and try to choke him out. Really? Like he was really going to tell Carol Kane that. No, no way. It wasn't going to happen. So how much do I really believe in what Rod Allen had to say to Carol Kane on Sunday? Uh, not much. I smell a lot of BS from what Rod Allen had to say to Carol Kane about the matter that transpired in September on the road in Chicago in that broadcast booth with Mario and Pemba. And to add to what uh, happened after the incident, there were three witnesses, staffers, that saw yes. what happened, and they were obviously sat down and interviewed, and they had to piece together what happened. And obviously Fox Sports Detroit isn't going to want to highlight the conversation that they had, but upper management 
from Fox Sports Detroit has called this a black mark. And this is something they definitely want to move away from and something that I think uh, definitely is a lesson in uh, talent management, that if talent is not uh, getting along, then just sitting them down once or twice and having meetings is not going to be enough. You have to have them definitely, no doubt about it, no doubts that these two people can get along. And after uh, rumors, everybody in the media basically said that they knew that Rod and Mario didn't get along. So Fox Sports Detroit probably dropped the ball in terms of how they handled it, and it finally bubbled over. And uh, it's probably a mistake they're not going to make twice. So I don't see Matt Shepard throwing down with Kirk Gibson, especially. You <laughs> but know, you want to see it happen, though. That'd be interesting, huh? Yeah. If they did throw down. Hey, give me back in his heyday. When Maybe. he was playing, Oh, he'd knock yeah. out everybody in that broadcast booth if he had to. He'd take everybody out. But the funny thing about what Rod Allen had to say, once again on Sunday to Carol Kane on Michigan Matters, he said that it was comparable to a brawl. <laughs> what happened between him and Mario and Bamba in the broadcast booth? Yes. Referred to it as a brawl in the broadcast booth. Oh, that can't be happening in the broadcast booth. Nothing resembling anywhere close, anything close to a brawl. It it just can't happen. So if that's occurring, anything close to a brawl, well, yeah, that's why you're no longer employed with the Detroit Tigers. You're bound to lose your job. (laughs) And you should. When you start brawling with a colleague in the broadcast booth, uh, that's a big no-no, Doc. All right, let's take our first time out. We'll come back. Uh, definitely want to get your assessment of Nick Castellanos. He signs a one-year deal. And I also want to get your assessment of some of the signings that have occurred and the pursuit of Manny Machado might be close in the division. We'll talk about a team that is maybe pursuing Manny Machado, offering him big money. We'll talk about all that next and more on this edition of Tigers Talk. And Doc, as you know, the Legacy Football Organization was founded in 2009. It is the premier off-season development program in the state of Michigan, in the Midwest, and in the entire country. And it provides unique platforms for student athletes on and off the football field through community service, social awareness, education, and football. And it consists of a staff of many former collegiate stars and NFL players such as legendary Lions wide receiver Herman Moore and former three-time All-American linebacker with the Michigan State Spartans, Docs, Michigan State Spartans, Greg Jones. And to find out more about Legacy Football and all of the events that they are hosting, please contact National Director of Football Operations, Justin Sassante, or go online to Legacy Football's terrific website at www.legacyfootballorg.com. And back here on Tiger Stock with Circle and Company. And, Doc, we have to discuss here Nick Castellanos and him inking a one-year deal to avoid arbitration. So he's not going to arbitration, and the Tigers' current right fielder now maybe has an increasingly positive trade value, you know, maybe more appeasing trade market for himself. And we'll see how it develops as the offseason does progress here, which, by the way, it's about to end. Spring training is about to come sooner than later. What are the numbers? So he agreed to a one-year deal worth $9.9 million. A little much, but, well, he did have a productive 2018 season. I do think that his bat definitely woke up at the right time, and especially in a situation where uh, you're uh, looking at arbitration. Nobody really likes arbitration, for those that don't know. You sit with an arbitrator, and you have to basically hear all your warts, and you have to hear why the organization doesn't want to pay you as much. Your agent obviously is going to pump you up. Nick is versatile. He's got an offensive bat. He's young. He's a leader and things like that. And the organization's got to be like, well, look at this film here. You see where he's like a step slow and his defensive war is really not the best and he's not really a foundational piece in the outfield. And so really players don't like arbitration. And I can understand why because you're sitting there like, you understand it's a business. They're trying to lower your salary. You're trying to get the most. But I do feel like, you know what, when you can avoid arbitration, it's fine. I'm interested to see if the Tigers are really interested in and keeping Nixie around if he's the guy. Because, like I said, what's been all the talk? Move him. Move him to first base. Get him out of the outfield. That outfield can't win with Nixie. He's getting better. And obviously, you give him credit for transitioning from third base to the outfield. Vito, it's just pretty obvious he's not an outfielder. No, and he's not going to last, I think, playing in the field long term. And now Anthony Fennick wrote a piece about how this arbitration, avoiding it for Nick C and getting this one-year $9.9 million deal for 2019 – could increase his trade value with, you know, these other Major League Baseball clubs out there. So, does it? I think it actually perhaps does. I and mean, he didn't get $10 million here. 
And he probably, he wanted north of 10 mil, I've got to believe, because he had a great season offensively. But his defensive numbers definitely dipped his value, and it lowered his salary to 9.9 mil for 2019. But you're right, when they go to arbitration, you know, you have these people on the other side of the table that are trying to negotiate a lesser salary for the player. Well, the agent's not going to have any of that. Right. Well, when you suck in the field as often as Nick C. did in right field throughout the course of 2018, <laughs> your value's in a dip and your salary will dip subsequently. So it's below 10 mil, which I think is a price that Tigers uh, have to be and are willing to spend for him. And I think it makes a trade more feasible this offseason involving Nick Castellanos. Now I see here you have a note regarding Tigers' top catching prospect, Jake Rogers. And I think he's probably on a list uh, on Major League Baseball Pipeline's all-defense team. And uh, is this a guy that's making noise maybe to make his way up the roster? What's the future look like for Jake Rogers? What's the news you're hearing about about him? Jake Rogers is viewed as his premier defensive catcher. His bat, I don't think, is major league ready. And that's why he's still in the minors. He could be called up mid-2019. And he might be all right. But he has to improve with the stick. Because I think with the stick that he swings when he plays baseball. Because he's not a good enough all-around hitter right now. And I don't think he's going to bring great offensive value at the major league level. But even for the Tigers, who are going to be a middling ball club, downtrodden, well below 500 in 2019 and 2020 more than likely as well, you still want to get some kind of offensive production out of your backstop that one day is deemed to be your everyday major league backstop. You can't have a well, replication of James McCann from 2018. You don't want that in your backstop production in 2019 and beyond. However, it's very bleak. The outlook for the catcher position in 2019 for the Tigers with Grayson Griner and John Hicks behind the plate, what are you going to get out of that duo offensively? And then Hicks, one of the two guys, can't even play defense behind the plate, meaning John Hicks. Grayson Griner at least can play D. I think he can throw out runners well enough, maybe not at the rate of James McCann. McCann. But Griner can be good enough defensively. It's about, how about this offense? Where is it going to come from at the catcher position? Hicks will provide you some of that, but Hicks will also spell Cabrera at first base and be the DH because he can't start every day behind the plate. Now, hopefully one day Jake Rogers hits well enough to be a consistent and steadily productive uh, offensive presence at catcher. I just don't know if that's going to be what James or uh, Jake Rogers becomes one day. I think he's going to be an offensive liability when he hits the major league level. Now, I know all of Metro Detroit, and yourself included, is super excited that Shane Green signed on the dotted line. He's back, baby. He's going to be the guy, probably going to be the closer, right? Yeah, because him and Jimenez will be the the guys at the back end of the games. You know, eighth, ninth inning guys, Shane Green, they're probably not going to take him away from that role. Really, it's not going to happen unless he's traded. I think he's a ninth inning guy from opening day on unless he... Obviously, there is a caveat that if he sucks <laughs> really bad in 2019, maybe they do pull the leash on him because you have Joe Jimenez. And then you can go to Jimenez and he becomes your closer. But I'm of the mindset that, you know what, you don't need a formal closer. You don't need that. We've talked about that numerous times now here on Tigers Talk. You need high leverage relievers that are effective in high leverage situations. So you don't need an everyday ninth inning guy or everyday eighth inning guy. It's whoever's the most effective in those high leverage situations, which might at times and was last year at times not Shane Green, but the Tigers' primary eighth inning guy in Joe Jimenez. Now, before we get to Vito's notebook, where you have a plethora of news regarding some signings, some potential uh, interest in uh, Manny Machado from an American League Central team, I want to get your sense of the whole Kyler Murray situation because it's really interesting, and I wonder if he uh, did hit up the Oakland days for $15 million. So for those that don't know, he's a two-sport athlete and obviously really talented. He was drafted Uh, by the Oakland A's to play baseball. Well, he had a breakout year in college, and he obviously declared after uh, a season at Oklahoma, and he's a guy that many people are impressed with, and they feel like is supremely talented at quarterback. And so he did declare for the NFL draft, but prior to declaring, there were reports earlier this week that, you know, the Oakland A's kind of shuffled a little bit. They were scuffling, and they traveled uh, the brass, uh, the big dogs, got on a plane, went to Dallas and kind of were like, look, they tried to convince Kyler that, hey, you know what, play baseball, come to spring training. And some reports came out that said that, you know what, uh, even though I got four to four and a half million dollars up front, I want $15 million to not go into the draft and maybe go to spring training. And I find that whole situation fascinating because I like the fact that he utilized his leverage. 
in that, he knew that there were two organizations that really wanted him. The NFL, they think that he's talented. He, he realized that not a lot of quarterbacks are coming out this draft. So outside of Haskins, there's just basically him, and he can go out there and maybe be drafted in the first round or maybe in the second. And he realizes, oh, man, the Oakland A's, they're sending their people. So he utilized leverage, and he asked for the $15 million. Well, unfortunately, the team that he's asking the money from, really cheap. And it's Oakland A's. Now, if it's the Tigers or the Red Sox and the Yankees, I feel like they might have made him an offer in the 8 to $10 million range or maybe double his signing bonus to maybe convince him where he's got like $9 million guaranteed and things like that. Because when you get $10 million from an organization, you realize, okay, I'm not going to sit in the minors for 12 years. I'm probably going to move my way up pretty quickly because when an organization invests that much money in me, they're going to want to see my ass on the field pretty quickly. They're going to want to start to push the marketing and sell my stuff and I'll get a chance to play a year or two guaranteed and I'll have a bunch of money. But in this situation, did the Oakland A's handle it right? Or do you feel like maybe there's still an outside chance that he plays baseball for the A's? Because I just see him being a quarterback. Well, Murray wanted the $15 million price tag. He might not even be worth that. As a first-round draft pick, you're going to get all that guaranteed money right off the bat without even proving yourself at the major league level? How is that right? And right to other players that have proven themselves, you know, uh, kicked ass, right, at the major league level for many years and haven't made that amount of money, especially in this day and age of baseball economics. That's double what Casey Mize earned for being the number one pick. Mize earned $7.5 million as, as a signing bonus. So how do you give somebody that's not drafted first double what – uh, somebody else that's drafted higher than you, that would probably put the pay scale out of whack to have that happen. So I, I don't, I, and look, did you hear too? There are rules in Major League Baseball that would have prevented that from happening. They waived the rule. Major League Baseball waived the rule to try and influence Murray to come play baseball. It's fascinating because they thought, well, maybe this guy's a star. And so, you know, it's always about dollars and cents and marketability. If you're the right guy, if you're somebody that's, uh, an influencer, if you're marketable, if you can do something for an organization or an entity, rules can be adjusted. And it's really interesting that they waived this rule to potentially slide him this money. It's crazy. Well, how about my marketability and influence? What happened to paying me then? Well, can you you know break the rules on me and pay me because I'm the marketable dude of this podcast network here? Well, when you do go and market the podcast, I would like you to be more factually accurate and to also expound upon the, By the things way, that you talk about. By the way, who got the chance to go on the podcast? Who was asked to go on the podcast, though? Was it you, the bald-headed 39-year-old? Who has a little bit of hair? You got his haircut today. He does have some hair, but who was it? You or I, John? Listen, Vito, I've done my fair share of marketing and things like that, and I definitely I love the fact that you go out there, but I would say that next time you do uh, venture out and discuss the podcast, take some notes and realize how many shows there are on the network, why we utilize certain things, understand some of those things, especially when the host is giving you some of the answers that he asks questions to. I thought it was very funny. You did a great job in the interview. You oh, did thanks. Very well. yeah, you put the, yeah, but you did a great job. But Come on. If you want top dollar, butt. but if you want top dollar, you got to be factually accurate. You got to push the the product a, a little bit better. So that's what you got to do. You got to be. You can't go and give an, a, a B minus performance and then expect A plus dollars. Come on now. You would have to. Be, I was listening. I'm like, wait a minute. He doesn't know why I use Podomatic. You were close and I did. I explained it well enough. Yeah, it was good. What do I need? Factually accurate. Now I'll say this. Do you want just facts? Or you want something entertaining too? What matters more at times on a podcast and a podcast platform? Right. Facts. Well, facts. If they're dull and boring, nobody cares about those facts after a while. Well, the question Just get close to well, that's what the answer is. That's, that's between, how I view it. No, that's between you and the questioner. That's not between me. I'm just saying I listened to the response that you gave, and you are factually inaccurate. And that's cool, wrong. that's wrong. Great. <laughs> You're not well, let's paid. be factually accurate here about one thing about Kyler Murray. Now he would have brought in some dollars for Major League Baseball as a whole. And for the Oakland A's, they would draw some fans to their ballpark where they're not getting a great amount of fans on a game-to-game basis here in Oakland. So they could use any kind of marketability out of their players that they can get. And they thought by getting their hands on Kyler Murray that that could be attained. And remember, too, for Major League Baseball as a whole, it doesn't market its young players. It's highly successful players and players that have influence. They don't market those players nearly enough. So... By getting Kyler Murray, they were willing to bend the rules and pay him all of this money, even as a first-rounder that's unproven in the major leagues, because they know he just won the Heisman, had a great year at Oklahoma, went to the Final Four in college football, and could bring a lot of attention to the game of Major League Baseball by becoming an Oakland A. 
Now, he's not going to suit up for the Oakland Athletics because his lifelong dream was to play in the NFL, where there's not more guaranteed money whatsoever. He could have received that $15 million right then and there from the Oakland A's without even fielding one ground ball. You know, he's a middle infielder without even taking one AB, would have gotten all of that money. And man, it'd be nice to pocket all that change for me and a lot of us here, you and I both, right, Doc? But he turned it down for the chance to fulfill his dream of playing in the NFL, where right now people are speaking about him not only being a first rounder, John, but being the first quarterback taken in this year's NFL draft. All right, Vito, hit me with this week's Vito's Notebook. What's going on? I know you got a lot of information. Some interesting names have signed with teams, and a big name is uh, being courted by a team in the AL Central. Manny Machado is still out there. You are right. Being courted heavily by the White Sox right now. Oh, the White Sox. are going to give a lot of years and a lot of money to this dude, who is only 26 years old, can play shortstop and third base, and reportedly it's an eight-year contract offer from the Chicago White Sox. A lot of money from a team in the White Sox on the south side of Chicago that typically don't spend big bucks on free agents. But they want to retool on the fly here and get relevant once again and draw some fans to the south side of Chicago, to U.S. Cellular Field, where recently they haven't averaged a great attendance number. Now, Tigers haven't either, but they've been, you know, they were completely irrelevant this past year and, you know, second half of 2017. But if you want to start getting relevant, well, the way of really accomplishing that. Um, to perfection is by getting big-name players on your ball club. And by signing Manny Machado, they will have accomplished that. So hopefully for the White Sox's sake, they do land a big fish out there in Manny Machado. And then you look at another middle infielder who has played second base in the past for the Colorado Rockies, a Birmingham Brother Rice product as well. And not Brad Gailey. Dun, not dun, Brad Gailey, dun, dun, the Michigan Sportscaster of the Year. But Goes to the Evil Empire. Dun, yes, dun, goes to the Evil dun, Empire. Dun, dun. Talking about DJ LeMahieu. A great gold glove winning second baseman in years past with the Rockies. And the Yankees have come out and said, so far, all the reports point to the fact that LeMahieu will be utilized in kind of a utility role. Really expressing and exploiting his versatility to the fullest. As he is a guy that can play a little bit of shortstop, will play third base with the Yankees as well, and then plays second base. And a very fine second baseman. But it might mean, and all signs point to the Yankees now being out of the sweepstakes for the aforementioned Manny Machado because of landing D.J. LeMayhew. So it looks like they're not going to land the big fish in Manny Machado, the Yankees, which is kind of surprising for a lot of people, I think, and what they expected coming into this offseason, knowing that Machado really wanted to end up in the Bronx. So I guess there is still that glimmer of hope because of the fact that Machado has been a lifelong Yankees fan. And so maybe he still lands there. But remember, the Yankees also added Troy Tulowitzki earlier in the offseason, along with recently adding... DJ LeMahieu. Any word or any movement on the Bryce Harper situation? I know it's basically every single week it's kind of been a little bit quiet, but um, teams don't seem to be clamoring with big offers. And I think I did read something, too, in that I think there's been a little bit of talk regarding some of the contracts that have been offered. They seem to be a little bit down in terms of free agent dollars. They're starting to be a little bit of a trend that people are realizing that, you know what, only a couple organizations are bidding for these players, and I think it's driven the price down. Did you see that as well? The money's not as actively out there. That's the thing. Yeah, Teams are kind of, well, Tightening trying, the budget, yeah. Yes, big time. And limiting the amount of money they're spending on these big-name free agents. Who, I am of the opinion that Bryce Harper and Manny Machado are all-star caliber players. But have they been consistently great throughout their big league careers? Every single year? No. The answer is no, for sure, with both guys. Even though Bryce Harper has won the MVP with the Nationals in the National League. But this past year, his war wasn't great. Machado's in the past, before last year, the season prior in 2017, it's not like he had great numbers all around. Now, in 2018, he had a great season. But remember, Machado is also known as this guy that doesn't hustle. He's no Johnny Hustle. He's no Pete Rose out there hustling down the line to beat out a ground ball to get to the bag at first base safely. He's not known as that type of player. And when you're not known as that guy full of energy and bringing the hustle, and then you think about these teams starting to be more and more financially savvy and not being as willing to spend big money on these big-name free agents, well, it then limits the market for these guys who are, once again, outstanding ball players, are all-star caliber players year in, year out. But are they truly great? They have the intangibles to be great. But has Machado been great year in, year out in his big league career in the past with the Baltimore Orioles and with recently the L.A. Dodgers? Uh, No. He wasn't that go-to slugger for the Dodgers all the time and consistently enough down the stretch there. And as they made that 
well, the run for the NL pennant and went to the World Series. He wasn't a go-to slugger for the Dodgers, game in, game out. For all the money that the White Sox are more than likely going to spend on Manny Machado, he should be that type of slugger that hits at the top of your order or in the middle of your order and is a hugely consistent run producer. You can't trust upon that with Manny Machado. And that's why I think it, it limits the market when there's also teams once again becoming more and more financially savvy. And once again, back to Bryce Harper, you can say the same thing about Harper. Has he been great year in, year out? The guy that's producing north of five war and being this great MVP caliber player. Not every single year. Now, he has an MVP trophy to show for his worth. But, you know, it's one MVP. He's no Mike Trout. He's not a multi-MVP award winner. A guy that is consistently great. That is a guy I would break the bank open for. I would pay him whatever he wanted. Really, simply uh, slide to him a blank check and tell him, you fill in the dollar amount. How much money you want, you fill it out on this blank check. Mike Trout is worth that. Bryce Harper and Manny Machado are truly not worth that. And especially in today's day and age of Major League Baseball. Fiscal responsibility, something that a CEO like myself loves in that you can't pay talent that you don't think you're going to get great returns on. And right now, the best jobs are in Boston, in L.A., in the big markets, in New York. Now, a little bit of pressure in New York, obviously, to succeed, and they haven't in recent years. And uh, Boston's kind of come up and snatched away a little bit of the pub and things like that. So for the other organizations, a lot of work needs to be done to put competitive teams out there. And uh, it is starting to look like you know the, the top five and the rest <laughs> are trying to tank. And uh, it's really going to be interesting to see uh, about attendance and interest going forward in baseball because of the fact that right now the competitive balance a little bit down, especially with the World Series, you know, having the Dodgers from the NL in the last couple of years. You had Houston, you had uh, Boston. So you need a team like the Toronto Blue Jays or a team from Baltimore or something like that to kind of come up and uh, make some noise as well. Or maybe, you know, even the likes of Texas or uh, Anaheim and things like that. You need some teams that are poised. Oh, well, Brad Ausmus now in LA with the Angels. They're on the rise. But how about the White Sox realistically? If they land a big fish in Manny Machado, yeah, they, have a chance they might to. be on the rise. In a weakened American League Central Division where the Royals and Tigers are inept and have no hope for 2019 and 2020, I mean, you got a shot. And the Indians are trading away a guy or two retooling on the fly. That division might be up for grabs. And maybe not for the White Sox in 2019. But in 2020, the White Sox could realistically win that division in the American League Central. Great podcast recording. You can follow Vito on Twitter at Vito Jerome. Definitely check out the in-depth interview he did with Nolan Bianchi. You can find that on sportsmedianow.com. Definitely great insights into the network and the stuff that Vito's doing uh, and marketing and very interesting podcast. I enjoyed it thoroughly. You can follow the network at Detroit Podcast. Definitely jump in. We read every single comment, uh, if anything, in the world of baseball. If you've agreed with Vito or myself regarding Matt Shepard having the job, let us know. We read everything, good or bad. We greatly appreciate the interaction. I look forward to talking to you in a couple weeks, I believe. Probably doing this every other week yeah, or so. Yeah, for right now at least. Until some major news happens and things like that. So, we good? I think we are, John. Let's get Thank the you out for here. that. By the way, Bianchi and I, I believe, are two paisans. You oh. and I are. Can't say that about you and I, John, unfortunately. But anyways, with that, adios.